chapter 11, analysis and strategy for investing in stocks. This is the chapter that's going to be particularly important to you for your life outside of school and when you get your first job. And because not everybody in this class is going to want to manage um, their own investments. They may, but they're all, but everybody in this class is going to need to have some sort of investing a strategy. And you, you need to know what level of involvement you're going to have in your investments, in your portfolio, uh, for your retirement, for your future goals, and things of that nature. OK, so investment strategy, um, the most important decisions you have to make is if you want to be passive or active. Passive is, is basically putting all your money in a set of uh, investments and not touching it again. Just sort of, you know, turning the oven on, waiting till retirement and seeing what pops out. Hopefully it's a, a well-cooked portfolio, uh, a tasty portfolio and not something that's been burnt and dried up and destroyed. Uh, more, or if you want to take a more active approach. And an active approach would be something similar to what you're doing in the virtual stock market. Buying and trading stocks, analyzing stocks, deciding on more aggressive movements into and out of different stock positions. So the, the passive approach has a lot of advantages. One of the most, the biggest advantages is it reduces overall costs and time. Your time involvement in the, in the passive is much smaller than the active. Um, and it, because you don't have to do the work of setting up and maintaining a portfolio. But the passive results uh, typically give you an average return close to the market. Um, now, the biggest factor in your returns in the stock market is the total stock market movements. You know, the ups and downs of the market during recessions, uh, expansions, and things of that nature. So the fluctuations of uh, the individual stock prices in the market is going to be a big factor on your portfolio. So a lot of cases, there's been a lot of research and studies where monkeys throw darts at the Wall Street Journal and put together 30 stocks or, you know, there's a, uh, a random generator picking 30 stocks and they seem to do as well as people who are actively managing and picking their own 30 stocks. And a lot of that has to do because of the market. So if the market has five great years from, say, 2009 to 2014, the um, returns are going to be great for most stocks. So even if you just put a random pool of stocks together, likely to get, you're likely to get an average return. And if it's five great years of 10 plus percent return, you're going to have a pretty decent portfolio. Uh, the same is true if it's a downward market during a uh, recession. You could have the 30 best stocks that normally perform very well, but if it's a, if it's a situation where the stock market's losing 40% of its um, uh, share price in six months, you're going to do badly. So with that in mind, time heals all wounds in the stock market. So if you could wait out these downturns in the market, you're going to win out. And that's sort of the basis of this passive investing is just, you know, just stay the long-term course on it. And to be, to get to be successful in the stock market, um, you have to be fully invested in the stock market for long periods of time because that's how your money compounds and grows. Okay, we'll talk more about that later. The, um, okay, so there's two, if you're going to go ahead and have a serious investment, there's two steps that every investor has to take as sort of a starting point for how they're going to put their portfolio together and the investment decisions they're going to make based on your objectives and your preferences and your risk preferences. The first is your asset allocation. You, have, you must decide what percentage of your money you want to have in cash, stocks, bonds, real estate, other investments. So you need to have a general idea of where your money should go. And a lot of times the asset, elevation, uh, asset allocation deals with two main factors, risk and age. So how much risk you want to assume and how, what your age is and how soon you want to retire. So if you're uh, 25, you should have most of your money in stocks and take a bigger risk because you can invest for a longer period of time. But if you're 55, you may want to have more of your money in bonds than the stocks if you're retiring soon. And then step two is the security selection. 
actually picking out the financial instruments and stocks that are going to make up your portfolio. So it's not enough just to know your allocation. You have to also know where exactly do I want to put my money. Uh, let's, let's take Japan as an example. So in 1980, Japan seemed like an invincible economic powerhouse with um, just year after year of very impressive exports, growth in industries, growth in sales, uh, low unemployment, very successful GDP. And the, the, and the Nikkei stock market was a, a reflection of how great how, of a success Japan had in the 80s. And the stock prices rose tremendously. Uh, from its peak from 1989 through November 2008, the Nikkei index, however, lost 80%. So at its very peak in 1989 till today, 2008, it's been, a, it's been uh, 20 years of stock market drought. And, the inde and their index has lost 80% of its value. So no matter how great of an asset allocator you were or, or an investor or stock picker you were, if you were 100% in Japanese stocks over this period, you, you didn't perform well. So that's one reason for being a little bit more diversified around the world. And you shouldn't have 100% of your, your money in U.S. stocks, which some people wind up doing, or having a very much higher percentage in U.S. stocks than they should. But you can have situations where um, there's a bubble in the Japanese stock market that occurred over nine years of extreme economic success, and then Japan enters a more flatter or downward economic trajectory, and their stock market gets decimated. You don't want to be the person that had, you know, and a lot of people, a lot of portfolio advice during this period was to have majority of your, or a significant portion of your, your money in Japanese stocks because they were doing so well. Is there a parallel today with the Chinese economy, the Chinese stock market, and, and what could possibly happen if their economy enters a slower period, which it seems to be the growth, seemed, there's still growth, but it seems to be slowing a little bit now. And that's what some investors do worry about, is especially with the money flows being a little bit, the opportunities in real estate being less, uh, more money is being driven to the, the Chinese stock market by its citizens than in real estate in past years which has helped to it further inflate um, the Chinese stock market. So how much longer will this trend continue? It could be 5, 10, 15, 20 years, but at some point there will be a pullback as there is with every market. A key concern is your required rate of return. We talked about this in previous chapters. And what we're worried about here is um, what's the minimum expected return you want for your money? So you know today that if you had $100,000 in a savings account, the 0.25% interest you're earning on that account probably is not meeting your expectations of return. You know, there's really no risk, but you're really actually having a negative return once you factor in inflation. So it's this trade-off, though. You have to figure out how much risk can you handle and how much of a return should you get for that risk. So the required rate of return um, sometimes known as K, here we're saying it's ROR, card uh, rate of return, uh, is going to be the risk-free rate, which is usually the 10 or 30-year treasury bond, whatever you want to look at. Most people look at a 10-year treasury bill, plus the risk premium. And in previous chapters, we discussed the risk premium. The cas capital asset pricing model is one way to measure risk premium, as with other, um, with beta being the major input in that. But you, you have to develop, based on the risks you're taking, how much return you're going to need. And these two together, the risk-free rate and the risk premium, is what you're going to need to compensate you for the risks of, of your portfolio. So again, if you're 25 and you're starting a full-time job and you're putting money into a 401k, you should be able to assume a higher level of risk because you have a longer time horizon. So you want to put your money in a risk appropriate vehicles for that. And for many investors, that would be industries like the tech industry or growth, growth oriented uh, mutual funds or indexes. But as you get older and you're, you're going to need that retirement money to retire on, and your, your risk tolerance is going to become less, and you're going to have to shift more of your money into bonds. But it's always important to understand what are the risks here? Are the, are the risks worth the reward for this particular stock? And you don't want to become a gambler or overly speculative where 
you just want the possibility of a higher return and you start ignoring the risks. And you can see that in some of the virtual stock market accounts, some people are investing in very risky stocks because they're hoping to get a 25% bump up in a day or two, but something goes wrong and the risks destroy a significant portion of their capital. And that's okay in a virtual stock market, but you don't want that to happen in your real stock account. Um, and there's a happy medium between some people are too conservative and too scared to trade in their, their actual brokerage account with real money, but overly aggressive and overly risk taking in the virtual stock exchange. If you're the person who can kind of meet the middle of those two extremes, you'll do well as an investor. Okay, so the passive stock strategies is a belief in efficient markets and a, and a belief that if you cover your bases and you hold a significant position in stocks that's balanced over time, you're going to be able to beat uh, the, you're going to be able to beat most active traders. Um, so the the great thing about this passive strategy really minimizes the transactional costs and the tax costs spent on managing a portfolio over time. Just think about the amount of trades you're making in the virtual stock market, and you're racking up you know ten dollar commissions or seven dollar commissions every trade. And you, some people are up in the hundreds of trades. That's a lot of money eating away of your, at your capital. Uh, you know, there are some people who, you know, take me for example, um, back in the um, 1990s and early 2000s, I was trading Apple back and forth and making money with Apple. And I calculated that I would have made far much more money if I just kept my initial, you know, I bought a thousand shares of Apple at split adjusted. I think it was like a three dollar rate split adjusted, a thousand shares. So if I had kept a thousand shares of Apple, I would have one do all the splits, a lot more shares, and now it's at $100 um, a share. It would have been much more, I would have made thousands of percents, 10,000 percent more return if I passively just held those thousand shares from when I bought them, I think it was 1990, uh, it might have been 2000 or 2001, I think it was the last time I bought that a lot that size. If I would have just held that today, I would be very wealthy. But I get five dollars, the stock goes up five or ten dollars, I make five or ten thousand dollars, I think I'm you know, the smartest investor in the world, and I sell that and invest it in other stocks. And those other stocks never did as well as Apple did over these last you know, 15 years. So that's just one example of where being passive can really pay off. And it's also, um, the thing about being passive is sort of like you forget about your stocks for a while and you can relax. If you're actively trading, which you are in the virtual stock market, sometimes you're making trades too quickly or you're just giving, not giving your ideas time enough to really be profitable. And you're moving things around, your, your emotions are, and your excitement is making you make decisions that are more hasty, and haste makes waste in the stock market. So if you're hasty and you have a good idea and you don't stick with it and you get frustrated and you sell out when the stock goes down a few points, you miss out on the longer term gain. So sometimes having a passive approach can be more beneficial. Um, so you're not trying, in the passive approach, you're really not trying to find undervalued stocks or you're not trying to find the intrinsic value of, of the stock. You're not trying to time the market. Instead, you're just passive, passively investing with, with you know, your concerns of achieving returns over a long time and minimizing costs. So a good passive approach, it would be Something I would recommend to say a 401k for anybody. So if you have a 401k, pick, and at the end of this lecture I'll show you, there's a, sort of a, 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 an idea of a portfolio you can put together. But you pick a reasonable portfolio, maybe five different, four or five different index funds with a low cost, and you just keep, add, you don't ever take money out or pull money out, you just keep adding money to it. And you never have to worry about moving your money around or you just, maybe you do a reallocation at some point to even them out if things have gotten a little out of balance, but you just keep adding money to it, you never really have to sell anything. And that's really freeing because you kind of make your setup and you can just leave it for years and years at a time. You know, at least from 25 to 35, there's not much you have to change. And you only have to make uh, asset allocation adjustments for when your risk level changes. But the actual buying or selling of these uh, stocks with an index is are very minimalized. You're just mostly buying in the good times and the bad times. And at the end of it all, as long as this um, trend in this bull market continues, which it has over the last 100 years, you'll do very well. And if you don't have to pay a lot in costs, and that's one thing that really kills 401k 
plans, is that when you invest in these actively managed mutual funds inside the 401k, there's a lot of costs and fees they charge you. So just by, you know, for example, you could lose two percentage points, or what we call 200 basis points, in an actively managed mutual fund in a 401k, or you could take an index fund, say index on the S&P 500, that may only charge 25 basis points, which is a quarter of an interest, quarter of 1%. And that difference goes a long way to, you know, especially if the two um, historically, the managed and the passive, perform in a similar level, if not the passive usually being the active, having the extra 1.175 basis points on your side that you're not spending in costs really adds up into your returns over long term time periods. So it's this buy and hold strategy, which I should have done with Apple. I should have just bought it and held it. Um, it it's a belief that the active management is just going to incur costs and you're just, you know, you're going to miss the future potential of the stock. Uh, so you just want to reinvest the income if there's dividends and you just, you can make adju adjustments for risk tolerance like I had talked about, but at the end of the day, you want to just keep holding on to that stock or increasing your position in it. So if you find a really great company, you know, uh, that has a good long-term potential, you shouldn't be afraid to buy into it initially, even if it's at a high price. Because if you have a plan to consistently buy the stock for a lifetime, you're going to get the higher and lower prices at different points of the economy. And overall, that will average out to a pretty decent purchase price. And as this you know, position grows, you do very well. So if you could just you know, um, find 30 great companies and passively hold them for 10 years, you'll probably do very, very well. I mean, it could be some, even though it's a passive strategy, sometimes you do have to sell. Sometimes companies fall apart and you just want to, you just have to sell, move on and get a different company. So there is some trading, but most of it is just really buying and holding on to a company that you know is really great. Now, selecting 30 stocks to begin your passive portfolio, it, for most people it's too much work and, it, and that's why the indexes offer a little better passive strategy. Because here, you're going to have, one, you're going to have many more stocks than, say, 30 stocks. So you're going to, but it's easy to get in and out and build a portfolio, say, 25% international, 25% domestic, certain percent small cap or large cap. I mean, you could get a, a, a bunch of different indexes to do what you want. Um, but you don't have to uh, forecast any market movements. You don't have to... Um, Look for overvalued or undervalued securities. You just, when you have the money and you're ready to invest, you just buy this, these groups, four or five index funds. Uh, you have lower cost, low turnover, very uh, much better tax efficiency because the index funds, you pay very little tax in the index funds while you're owning, owning them. And that's the key thing. When you sell any stock, there's a tax or index fund outside of a 401k, there's a tax consequence. So if you made $5,000 and you sell, now you're going to have to pay tax on that state and federal. And then use that money to buy back into the stock at a later date. You have less money to buy back in than what you sold because you have to pay tax on your gains. But if you hold it consistently, you don't have to pay tax on that. Now, index fund or mutual fund with index fund, they're not trading that much. So they're not generating a lot of tax liability for you. But a mutual fund manager who's actively trading and churning in the account can wind, could stick you with quite a big, large tax bill at the end of the year because you have to pay tax on any capital gains that the mutual fund manager develops. Even if the fund lost money, even if you lost 3% of your return, there still might be $3,000 worth of capital gains you have to pay for. So the index is a little bit more tax efficient. And we covered this before in the mutual fund chapter. Um, so it's a buy and hold at a low price point, a low cost point, that makes index funds one of the best strategies for a passive investing environment, because it's low cost. Now, they have a hybrid, and this is an area that's a little unusual. It's called an enhanced index fund, where they take an index fund, but the mutual fund manager, uh, the fund manager comes in and enhances it slightly to improve performance. So if it's tracking the S&P 500, they may, they may overweigh some sectors that prove to be a little bit, return a little bit more than others. So you may have some sectors that are historically slow, very slow growth, very slow to uh, make money um, and grow in capital gains. And other sectors in the S&P 500, like biotech or medical or healthcare or technology or education that grow faster. 
So they may actually kind of double up in some sectors and pull back a little bit. But these are not as big of decisions or changes as they would do in a fully active trade, um, a fully active mutual fund. They're making the slight percentage tweaks. Um, they can also use futures and options um, to simulate uh, a portfolio in the S&P 500 while, which you only need with a, with a future contract, you only need 2% down of, the, of your capital. And the other 98% you can borrow. Future contracts are not something that individual investors, small investors can utilize, but mutual fund managers can. So they could take, say they have a billion dollars invested with them. They can take a small percentage of that to create using future contracts, which is creates extreme leverage to duplicate a billion dollars worth of investments in the S&P 500 and then take all the cash that they're not actually putting in stocks and put it in the bank account uh, of some high yield account and make three, four percent return uh, on interest on that money while the rest of the money is in uh, futures contracts. So you get the benefit of the same return in the S&P 500 plus a little extra interest. And that would be sort of an enhanced uh, index fund where they, they play a little financial leveraging or a couple, a little strategies on top of the index. But they're always, generally, they're, a lot of these enhanced index funds is they, they have some kind of guarantee they'll meet the index um, with the possibility of doing better than the index. And of course, there's the most efficient vehicle is the ETFs, exchange traded funds that we've also covered in the previous chapter. But these are great for passive strategies because um, there's as many ETFs uh, possibilities as there are mutual funds. And, you, and many of the, most of the ETFs are based on indexes. So you can accomplish the same objectives as an index fund at an even lower cost because the ETFs have an even lower cost. And then you can, um, and these are more easily bought and sold because uh, you don't have to worry about uh, float, um, or loads, opening, ending, closing loads, and so they, they typically are much more efficient vehicle. And that's why the exchange traded funds have uh, skyrocketed up in the total amount of money invested with exchange traded funds compared to mutual funds. They're actually, you know, at some point in the future, they'll probably overtake mutual funds. The only thing that's really stopping them is that you can't, most 401k accounts won't allow you to invest in ETFs. They, they exclusively lock you into mutual funds. But once ETFs make more of a stronger appearance into people's 401ks, then they'll probably, by their nature of being more cost effective and better investments, will overtake the mutual fund industry in total dollars, say, invested. Okay, so let's move into the active portion. So here, if you're somebody who possesses a unique set of talents that enable you to uh, find the stocks that I could perform the best, um, you may want to favor the active approach. Most investors, however, most investors, they favor the active strategies because you're doing something, you're more involved. However, a lot of the analysis and research on this shows that passive investors have a better lifetime return than active investors. So, and looking and crunching the data and you're comparing the two pools of people, the passive investors have, a, have had a leg up on returns in their portfolio over the active investors. But that's not true for every active investor. There are a lot of active investors who have significantly higher returns than passive investors. Uh, I myself consider myself sort of a hybrid model where a significant portion of my portfolio is definitely passive approach but then I, I keep a smaller a subset of my portfolio for more active trading. So that way I can kind of get the best of both worlds. I have a majority of my investments for retirement in safe, um, predetermined uh, buy and hold indexes and uh, passive strategies. Meanwhile, allowing a certain percentage of my portfolio for me to be actively managed. So that way I can kind of um, if, I, if my active management is poor, I don't really destroy my investment, my re retirement potential. However, if my active management is successful, I can add two, three, four, five extra percentage points of return in my total portfolio, even though I may only be risking 10% of the capital. So that's sort of an approach I take, which I think is kind of conservative. You still have the protection and the reliability of a passive strategy, but you open up the possibility 
for you not to miss, you know, every, I believe in everyone's lifetime, there's going to be an opportunity, an investment opportunity that's going to come your way in stocks that it's just going to be very clear that, you know, the, the opening day of Google or uh, Chipotle Mexican Grill or Under Armour, whenever that IPO came out, even though it may have came out at a high price, people thought Google at $100 which I think split adjusted is a lot less, uh, was so much money. But if you're looking at it back today, when, at Google's current share price, it wasn't. So you want to be ready, though, because sometimes these investment opportunities on the active side are only available for a short period of time. And if you have to take the step of finding the money, opening an account, and at the time you're ready to actually trade that stock, the investment opportunity may have passed you by. You know. Um, Okay, so they cover everything there. Okay, so you basically want to identify individual stocks that are going to offer you a superior risk return trade off uh, and create for yourself some sort of portfolio that you're actively going to manage. And the big importance here is how you select your stock and your stock selection and your overall investment process, which we've covered a lot in this class on how to look at value and think about buying and selling stocks. Now, Peter Lynch is by far the greatest mutual fund investor, the most successful mutual fund manager and investor of all time. And he wrote a book called One Up on Wall Street. I read this book in high school, and it's really what got me interested in stocks and led to some of the best advice I've ever had in the stock market and, and to significant returns in active trading that I had um, from his common sense and approachable advice that he offers in this One Up on Wall Street book that's a, that's a multi-million copy bestseller. And, you know, he had, he, he made this statement <clears throat> and he was the head of Fidelity's Magellan Fund, which was the first super mutual fund. And he had beaten the indexes in the stock market for like a ridiculous amount of quarters over his tenureship of this mutual fund. So he said, if I had a choice between investing in a good company in a great industry, or a great company in a lousy industry, I'll take the great company in a lousy industry any day. So what he meant by that is, you know, sometimes looking in a place that most investors are not looking, so if it's a lousy industry, maybe a lot of investors are just ignoring it, but sometimes there's a one great company in a lousy industry who's gonna make extreme profits and do very well in an industry that's really not that, you know, doesn't have that much uh, spark or it's not really that popular or has that much future potential, you know, for example, if you look at the cigarette industry, that's an industry likely to decline as people become more educated, understand that smoking is really dangerous for your health and um, government changes their attitudes towards how these cigarette companies can advertise and promote to people, a lot like the U.S. did when uh, um, the U.S. reduced its smoking rate by 50 percent once they in, uh, enforced regulations on the amount the cigarette companies can advertise, putting health warnings on the cigarette packs and funding uh, certain educational programs. But still, you find a great co there are great companies inside the cigarette industry that do very well. Some of my best investments over the past 20 years have been cigarette companies. Even when uh, I bought them when close to when they were, they were getting that lawsuit from the states were all suing all the cigarette companies and they had to do this multi-billion dollar payout to all these states uh, and cigarette valuations of companies were just at a really all-time low and I just found one or two good cigarette companies that had a good international portfolio and those, you know, those went up a thousand percent in, in a ten-year period. So basically what he's saying here is that you could find a great stock anywhere. You don't have to limit yourself to great, uh, great industries. You, you also can look at less popular or industries that are lousy, but there's still really good possibilities as companies to buy inside of those industries. And that was one of his successes, that he found companies that other people were not looking at, were missing, that he found and invested in, and those companies became, you know, more recognized and more successful later on. Okay, so A majority of your investments and investment advice is geared, uh, actually the majority of investment advice you're going to receive is going to be geared to helping you select individual stocks. And a securities analyst's job is to forecast stock returns. And this is the role you're sort of playing in making the stock analysis report is that you're a securities analyst. And you're estimating 
you know, um, you're providing estimates of expected change in earnings per share, expected return on equity, and the industry outlook, and you're going to make a recommendation buy, sell, or hold. Now, these are important because uh, the average percent change or the, stock price, uh, or the movement of a stock price in a single day following an analyst's recommendation, so when an analyst initiates a recommendation or changes a recommendation, on the upside, you can have you know, over 2% change in that stock price that day because the analyst made a recommendation. On the negative side, you can have uh, over a 5% decrease if an analyst goes from a buy rating to a sell rating on a stock. The more legitimized or popular or well-known the analyst is, the more the stock will take the hit. But there's definitely, we've definitely been able to track and show a significant change in stock price based on analysts' change in recommendation. So people do look at these stock analyst recommendations and they do trade upon them. Now, a typical analyst report, which you know because you're working on one, contains a description of the company's business, how the analyst expects the company to perform, earnings estimate, price estimates, or price targets for the stock you know, for the year ahead, and recommendations as to buy, sell, or hold. An analyst attempt to forecast you know, the, a specific stock price for the company at a growth rate or a return. Um, and it's all about really the company's earnings, an estimate of the company's future earnings, because those future earnings are what's going to determine the future price. Now, there's two types of analysts, and I was talking about this a little bit earlier. There's the sell side and the buy side analysts. Now, the sell side analyst, and that's um, somebody who sells stock to people. So if or a company that sells stock to people. So if they have analysts recommending, com recommending stocks it's, or covering stocks, it's uh, for the betterment of the investors they're advising, saying that we are, at, we are covering all these stocks, we advise that you buy this you know, subset of stocks, we put buy recommendations on, and they go out and they market that and advertise that to investors to get them to invest with their company. And so they're selling the uh, analyst advice to small investors to encourage them to buy with them. And that's a tough job. That's commission based and it's a very competitive industry. A lot of money can be made in this industry, but it's a tough industry or job to be involved in. On the buy side, it's a little bit easier industry to survive in and make a decent amount of money, but a much more difficult industry to get employed in. So in the sell side industry, everybody in this class, I can guarantee that you can get a job in the sell side industry tomorrow if you wanted it. It's just that easy, but these jobs are 100% commission based. So you don't make any salary or, or any benefits, you just get a, a piece of the commission of what you sell. And that's why it's easy to hire as many people as they want because the companies really aren't losing much because they're not paying you unless you generate money for them. On the buy side, however, these are people employed by money management. You know, we're talking about mutual funds, pensions, uh, indexes, um, uh, well, modified indexes, uh, where well, you're searching for equities for firms to buy and invest in. So you're searching for investment opportunities for a pension fund or for a mutual fund. So you're not doing the analysis in the hopes that you're going to sell the stock to individual investors. You're doing the analysis to put together a professionally managed portfolio. Or you might work for, uh, um, I did some of this work for companies where I worked for a big company and they had money and they wanted to make investments. So you're, you're analyzing things for the company to buy, not individuals. You're not selling it. You're just doing analysis for a more institutional-based corporation or uh, company that are going to put together portfolios for investment. So the buy side is a lot more, you're not really making, um, the sell side is almost more like advertising. So you, you want to encourage people to invest more and you want to, um, provide the information to encourage further investment. On the buy side, you're really more uh, trying to strategize to get the best return possible for a more corporate-like entity or fund. And, and those jobs are a lot more difficult to become a mutual fund analyst or a pension fund analyst or a corporate financial officer. Those typically, a lot of the buy side analysts start out in the sell side and then graduate to the buy side with, with their sell side experience. Um, now, some problems with security analysis is that forecasting earnings per share is very 
difficult. And the analysts typically err on the optimistic side rather than the pessimistic side. So errors can be, can be large and do occur often. So the, the science behind estimating earnings per share is not that accurate. So the forecast, if you're using the forecast earnings per share to, to calculate the valuation of the stock, it's going to make it difficult to be correct in a high percentage. Uh, so we have all this modern technologies and advanced understanding of statistics and mathematics and understanding of stocks and financial markets, and es you know, but es uh, analyst estimates you know, have not become more accurate. So with all this data mining and technology and computers and ability for databases and Bloomberg terminals and CompuStat and all this data uh, and all these mathematical approaches, we still have not become more accurate in our, in in our forecasting of earnings. Um, now, a lot of analysts are under, under a lot of pressure to not, use, to not use the word sell. So, if they're following companies and, and a lot of, there could be a lot of hate or negativity generated when you put a sell recommendation on a company. That company's not going to want to work with you, or if your company that you're working for is in association with this company, they're not going to be so happy about these sell recommendations. And this, they got into a lot of trouble in, in the year um, between 2000 and 2003 where there was a lot of um, cross-pollination between companies who were providing services and um, uh, two corporations that they also had a different division providing recommendations for. So you might have an investment company providing um, different uh, working with companies and contracting companies that they're working with on various projects, um, but at the same time, a separate division of the company has analysts rec recommending the company. So there was a lot of pressure to say, you better put buy recommendations to this company because we have a big contract coming due um, you know, to install a computer system or, um, for the company, so don't ruin it for us. And new laws are developed to help make a, um, a more distinct separation between the, the analysts and the business section. Some companies were actually, like Arthur Anderson, were actually split apart to maintain a separation because of the conflict of interest. Uh, but there's still pressure uh, you know, from underwriters to issue buy recommendations. And as you see, most of the time, most stocks are holding buy recommendations. And there's very few percentage of stocks that are sell or hold. And actually, they came up with this new term, underperform. So they. Instead of saying sell, which is so negative, they put the word underperform so it doesn't look so bad, so semantics. Um, now, you could see something like this and say, anytime right before a major downturn in the stock market in 2000 or 19, I'm sorry, um, 2007, you'll see that most companies have buy recommendations and very, sell, very few sell recommendations. And then six months later, none of these stocks had met the target and the market went down 50%. What happened? How come all these analysts missed it? And that's been, you know, a consistent um, thing I've noticed with analysts. They miss the, you know, they don't see uh, um, the forest for the trees. Or did I say that backwards? Or is the trees for the forest? Well, either way, they don't see the bigger picture. And they don't see big movements and big changes. And they don't update their recommendations fast enough to really warn investors when they should sell. So when a company has a sell on it, that means you should, say that analysts changed the sell recommendation today. That means you should have sold the stock six months ago. You're really late to the party if you sell on the analyst recommendation. And when an analyst makes a buy recommendation, you should have bought that stock, that stock a year to six months before he changed it to a buy rec or created a buy recommendation. Because these analysts are really behind the curve so as an investor, if you're taking their advice and moving into the stock based on their buy and sell recommendations, you're acting on um, very old information. That's why some of the best, you know, if you're a more active trader, making your own analysis, creating your own buy recommendations for yourself and taking your own advice leads to much better results. And in fact, that's one of the first lessons I learned when I first started investing. I was taking everybody's advice and losing money everywhere. Because by the time you get this advice in a magazine or on TV or in a book, it's old. Everybody's already piled in and got all the money out of that stock. And you're just picking up dead fruit off the ground. And then I discovered that I need to make my own advice 
and get in there first or get in there early and see, see, see it before it's general knowledge that this is a good stock to buy. And that's what part of looking at, when we were talking about last class, looking at the percentage of the stock that's owned by institutions. If, there, if that's a small percentage of the stock, say 10 to 40 percent of the stock is owned by institutions, you're getting in early. If it's a good story and it's a good stock, you know it's going to be a, a good company, you're getting in early. And all the, all the, all the uh, institutional investors will pile into it once it becomes a well-known company or once it becomes obvious that it's a good stock moving forward. So you want to get there before majority of the money does. And the only way to do that is to do your own independent analysis. Now, if you don't want to do analysis at the stock level, that's a very active level, do, do it at the individual stock level. It's something I do, and it's tedious. I mean, I'm following 200 companies. I'm checking on them on a daily basis or a weekly basis. I'm looking at their charts. I'm reading their news and press releases. And it's, it's a, just a tiring job. Luckily, though, for me, I love it. So it's like a hobby. It's like you know, the thing I do in my spare time. I like fiddling with these stocks, looking at their returns or ups and downs, and you know, finding a good time to buy, get into the stock. And you know, it's just like a daily routine for me. It's sort of like exercising. So, so you know, and it's something maybe you could do in a treadmill. So if you go on a treadmill 30 minutes a day, you, you call up, you bring your uh, iPad with you, and you check all your stocks while you're doing your treadmill at the same time, if that's possible. I can't do that. but. Um, some people, or maybe at the least you watch, you know, uh, CNBC. Now, if, this, if the individual rotation is too much, you could do a sector rotation, which means instead of playing with individual stocks, you're playing with whole sectors. And we did talk about this before, but it's important. Um, you know that companies can be grouped into different sectors, and certain sectors perform better at certain periods of time than other sectors. And we could break this down into interest-sensitive stocks, consumer durable stocks, capital good stocks, and defensive stocks. So interest-sensitive interest stocks are more like the financial stocks and banks and, and mortgage-based companies. The uh, consumer durable stocks are more uh, things that you buy as a consumer, washing machines, uh, products, you know, anything you could shop for. Capital goods are more like equipment companies would buy. Um, equipment for companies are bigger pieces of purchases that companies would buy for their factories. And defensive stocks are stocks that do well during an economic downturn. So sometimes these four broad categories, I mean sectors can be broken down as you know from picking sectors in your report. There are many, many sectors and industries that there's a tremendous amount of them. But if you just wanted to kind of board, pull it back to four basic sectors, then you know, like right now, interest rates are poised to go down, to go up, because they're going to be start raising the federal funds or continue raising the federal funds. So interest sensitive stocks are not going to do well. So that might be an industry or sector you pull back on. But consumer durable goods and capital goods look to uh, do better as the economy is improving, while defensive stocks really aren't going to do much because, you know, the economy is still doing well. You don't have to be in defensive stocks by their nature or slower growing stocks. However, if things change and the economy starts to do terrible, you're going to want to move out of these capital and consumer uh, stocks and move back into defensive and, inter and uh, interest sensitive stocks. So sometimes it's just moving between those broad sectors uh, help people enhance their return. Now, It depends very much on your accuracy and your timing and your assessment of economic conditions. That's why sector rotation is so difficult for most people. Um, the best, you know, it's, it's really difficult to always kind of understand and predict where the economy is going and how the sectors are going to react to it. So it takes a lot of experience to be a good sector rotator. So you may have to study. Um, the, the, the economic cycles for five or ten years before you become an effective uh, sector rotator. I am currently still studying sector rotation, have yet to be super effective in this area, but I'm getting better. And um, I haven't really put a lot of money behind it, but I'm, I'm constantly thinking about it and, and kind of mock, making mock portfolios like I should move money out of these sectors and, and kind of judge where they're going. A big sector now that people are doing rotation on is energy. So as stock, oil prices have been falling and the economy has been sort of slower growth trajectories uh, and output's been increasing. A lot of people have moved out of the energy market sector. 
as they, as they wait for a bottom or settling of the prices or the energy sector. And then they'll probably rotate back in. A, trip, a, a, good, a good thing to do is when there appears to be a recession brewing or early stages of recession, you want to pull out of the energy markets because slower economies use less energy and energy oil prices shoot down pretty quickly. And you could see that the oil price in 2008 fell quite dramatically as the world economy slowed. And then when it sort of hits the bottom, and before the next economic expansion, you want to move back into the energy sector. Because as soon as the economy expands again, energy prices go up. So that's you know, one area of sector rotation. But you have to understand the business cycle well, and how the business cycle affects the industry. And understand political environments. You know, is there going to be a, you know, say you're in the oil and, and natural gas sector, is there going to be a lot more political will for people to invest in energy and wind and alternative solar uh, to combat global climate disruption? So is a political environment going to punish and uh, eliminate the subsidies for oil companies and put the subsidies on alternative energy companies? So big governmental changes like that are political changes you have to understand because that's going to affect the industry. Same thing with healthcare. A lot of people, <clears throat> if you were smart, and a few, a few years ago I was telling students this, listen, if Obamacare happens, you want your money in health care. Because now all these extra people, regardless to what you feel about Obama or Obamacare, that doesn't matter. I'm not going to get into a political debate whether Obamacare is good or bad. Uh, I'm going to get into a debate whether or not you should buy health insurance stocks. And my side was, yes, buy health insurance sector because more people are going to have health insurance. That means more people are going to use health insurance, which means these companies are going to make more money. And this whole you know, restructuring of the health care, no matter how people debate it, the bottom line is more health care is going to be used, which is going to equal more profits for health care providers. Even though they're saying, they're spinning it as like they'd make less money, we manage them better, costs would go down. Um, and costs have gone down. Well, actually, costs haven't gone up as much. But these companies all made phenomenal more profits because an extra 13, 20 million people have health insurance now. And when you have health insurance, you tend to use it more than when you don't. At least go to the doctor more. Uh, and this, this has to extend domestic and international. This is a domestic issue, the health care in the United States. But there are certain international issues that you want to think about when it comes to um, sector rotation. And of course, sector rotation, you're going to be exposed to greater risks than the overall market. Um, and you could use mutual funds or index funds uh, to do so your sector rotation. So instead of buying individual stocks, which are very expensive and risky, um, the ETFs, the indexes, and mutual funds have a broad spectrum of related products that mimic sectors. So you could easily use any of these vehicles to, to move back and forth between sectors. And you may, there are some investors that have it down so well that they know at this business cycle, I want to be in these sectors. When the business cycle changes, I sell those sectors and they move into these sectors. So sometimes they have a, 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 a three, sec, the three grouping rotation of the business cycle from expansion, contraction, expansion. So they, they group, they cycle through these uh, three lists of sectors they want to jump from as they see the economy changing. Uh, and then mutual funds are the easiest way, most effective way to do that, uh, or index or ETFs. And they're very popular with momentum traders. So momentum is sort of a subset of active trading where, um, and I've actually had much success in momentum strategies. It's one of my stronger suits where you find stocks that are moving upward and you grab onto them. So a momentum strategy is you're, you're favoring um, stocks that have a tendency to move higher. And stocks generally move in a pattern. Either they're going up or they're going down. Some stocks do waver up and down, and those stocks you stay away from. But the momentum strategy, you put together the stocks that are moving up, because they, um, they will continue to move up. Like, uh, and then the stocks that are moving lower generally continue to move lower. That's why it's never a really good idea to buy a stock whose stock price is falling. So you like a stock. Um, there's one stock I, I follow and I like very much. It's Yelp. I, find, you know, I found the, the product to be very useful and a lot of people using it, a lot of potential. So I started following the stock. And when the stock was going up, I, I owned it and I kept it. As long as it kept going up, it had great momentum. And then one day, the momentum changed and started moving lower. 
and I got nervous and I sold it. And, and it's moved significantly lower since, and I'm still not buying it because it still looks like it's continuing to move lower. Even though I think it's a great stock and I'd like to own it, I'm waiting for this downward trend momentum to stop and then the upward momentum to go. And it could be, it could move up $20 before I jump back on board on the stock, but that's just me waiting to confirm the momentum change. And I'm, I'm fine with that. So I'm like, as a shopper, you, you would really, if you were married to me, you would hate me because I'd go to every store and buy whatever, I'd go, what prices are going up today or what's not on sale and what's a high price? And I'd be buying that stuff. It would be a complete waste of money as a consumer to shop like that. But as a stock person, it makes money to buy the things that have higher price and the momentum moving higher. But a lot of people treat stock like their shopping mentality and they go into, a super, they go into the stock market like, a, like they would go into a supermarket and they're trying to buy things on sale. Oh, this is half off this week. Well, you know what? It's half off going to zero. A lot of stocks that are half off are heading down to zero or bankruptcy. So these momentum strategies is really trying to find a group of stocks or maybe a sector that has upward momentum and stick with it. So you find a sector that, hey, biotechs have been doing very well and there's upward momentum with them. I think they're overvalued. I think that it's risky, but hey, the momentum's there. I'm going to put my money behind it and hopefully I could jump off you know, that rocket as soon as it, it reaches its maximum elevation and starts to arc lower. That's a tricky point. It's easy to get on those, these momentum trains. You know, it's a, um, but it's a lot harder to jump off, a lot scarier. And <clears throat> marketing timing in general, uh, you're trying to earn you know, excess returns by moving your money in and out of the stock. So just think about it. I've had only one successful market timing in my life. I had a number of market timing failures, but in 2007, I pulled all of my money out of the stock market, which is the most and to Mark, and I knew that when I was doing this, I told everybody and tried to document it as well as possible. So that way, because no one really believes you after the fact. So I had it well documented and um, pulled all my money out of the stock market. And actually, I mean, me and Professor Palermo, we talked about this a lot. And we're just like, yeah, we got to get out of stocks. It's a bad environment. And it was just so clear what was happening. And stocks really hesitated before they moved lower. I mean, a lot of news were coming out that all these bad things are happening and the credit default swaps and the mortgages. It was just the news is out there well ahead of the stock market collapsing. So that was a one market timing. And I was lucky enough to get out and then get back in before the stocks move, started moving up. And I used that 50%. As soon as the markets went down 50%, which is historically very rare for the markets to go down a full 50% in a downturn, in a recession. Um, and that's when I put my money back in. And I was a really scary day because you feel like you're doing the wrong thing, but I just ignored my emotions and got back in. And I think that's probably the only time in my life where I'm going to do that. That's like the one and only time where I'm going to do that with my stocks. Because it, it was just a phenomenal in, event in history, this great recession, this great collapse of the stock market that I probably won't see again for 20 years. So I don't intend to do any more market timing. I'm going to be fully, you know, you know, I'm going to always have my money in stocks at some, you know, no, I can't really say what percentage, but I'm going to be, you know, invest in stocks. I won't pull that market timing trick again. It just happened to be a moment in time where it was so clear that did what was happening when most people had their head in the sand. And, uh, but what happens to people who market time, and you know, I wasn't the only one, I wasn't a genius for doing this. Many other people pulled their money out in time too, but they didn't put their money back in. And now, so they may have had a million, say they had a million dollars, they pulled their money out. And the market went down 50% and they feel like the smartest person in the world. But you know what? They were stupid because they didn't put that money back in. And now the market has gone back up to where it was in 2007 and beyond. It's reaching all time high now. So now you would have, you missed, if you would have been better just leaving your money in the market as a passive strategy, let it go from a million to 500,000, and now it's like a million too. So you would have been better off not market timing for these people who are going to sell but then not buy back in. So if you're going to have the, the rocks to sell your stuff, you better be as solid on the other side to buy it back because people tend to wait too long and they miss a significant amount of the upward movement when the market turns around. Because when it turns around, it turns quickly, and that's why you have to get in when things are looking really dark and bad, because when it starts to get positive, it's only a few days before the market may move up 20%. Um, 
Now, the thing that makes it so risky is if you miss a few months, you significantly suffer. So over a 40-year period, so if we have 40 years, um, looking like 40 years is going to be like 460 months. So <clears throat> if you miss the best 34 months out of 460 months, which is 40 years of trading, and you invested $1,000, you, you missed those 34 months out of 460 months, you only would have gone, risen up to $4,442. Instead of the full 86000 that that money could have become over that 40-year period if you just left all the money in and you didn't market time. So if you market time in the wrong months or the wrong days, you significantly will handicap your returns of your, on your portfolio. And I've seen this not in months, but I've seen a better analysis that does it in days. If you miss, if you miss the best 11 days of the latest bull market, it cuts your returns almost in half. So there are only a couple of key days where the market moves up significantly. So you may have a full year. In that full year, the market may have went up 20%. That may only really constituted five trading days that really pushed the market up that 20%. If you miss those five days because you're doing some sort of market timing, then it's, and that's what happens to most people at market time. Most people are not successful with market timing and usually devastate their retirement because of it. So a lot of people, and this is how they think they're going to market time. Stocks have gone down 40% and that's the time they think they should sell all their money, take all their money out of stocks after it's already fallen. You have to, if you're going to market time, you want to sell out when the stocks are at all time highs and buy back when they've retraced 30 to 40%. And very few people um, emotionally have, have the fortitude to do that. It's very difficult. You, you're better off, that's why some of these trading computerized trading works much better because you put all these information into what works and the computer just does it. It has no emotion about it. But it's much more difficult to see your money disappear and then make a move on it. One of the things that help make all this stuff possible is efficient market uh, ideas. So the EMH is the efficient market hypothesis which we're, we're going to talk a lot more next chapter. And what it basically, if it's true, active strategies are un unlikely to be successful uh, after you factor in all the costs. So if markets are efficient, the prices reflect the fair value that stocks should be. And that means if markets are efficient, you're never going to find an undervalued stock or a good stock opportunity. All the stocks are priced correctly for their potential. So just go in and buy stocks because it doesn't matter. Everything's priced correctly. Now, a lot of people don't feel that this efficient market is completely true, and they argue that a little um, time devoted to security analysis can help reduce taxes, reduce costs, and increase performance. Now, the, um, and I, I feel the second part of this is true, that the market is somewhat efficient, but because we're dealing with human emotions and human decisions and unpredictable economies, it's not always as efficient as it should be. So there is room for you to make some minor tweaks in your portfolio and your investment to enhance your returns. But that doesn't happen from reading one investment textbook or taking one course in investment. It comes from a lifetime of continued education. Reading other books, studying it, being interested, watching the market. If you're someone who has that interest in you, that you like the virtual stock market game, you like trading stocks, you like reading about it in the, in the Wall Street Journal or Investors Business Daily or Fortune Magazine or the internet, or you like to pick up stock bo books about stocks, the stock market, and you like to go to Yahoo Finance every day and see what's happening and track a portfolio of stocks, then you probably have what it takes to be somewhat active in your portfolio of your, of your investments over your lifetime. However, if you're the opposite of that, if you really are not interested in stocks and find it tedious and find this course difficult and not fun, then you should probably take a more passive approach and set your stuff up in a, in a common sense a portfolio and just passively let it accumulate for you. Uh, one such portfolio is this coffee house portfolio, which, which um, Bill, from, he used to work at, at Smith Barney, put together. It involves no trading, no rebalancing, no securities analysis, no strategizing. It's the ultimate passive strategy approach. And 40% of your portfolio will, will be in bonds, 60% in stocks. Um, and it's shown to you know, be safe and reliable over time. And I think it's great.
for 401k types of accounts. And this is the portfolio. You could do this with index funds or ETFs. Most 401k uh, portfolios now include a complement of index related funds that you could put, or mutual funds that are, are close enough that you could put this together. So the 60% equities, you want 10% in the S&P 500, 10% in large cap stocks, 10% um, in small cap stocks, 10% in small cap value stocks, it's a subset. These are all subset of uh, indexes or mutual funds. So you want the small cap value. 10% uh, in international stocks, 10% in real estate investment trusts, and 40% in a portfolio of bonds. Usually a, a, a pretty diversified portfolio of bonds. So this is just you know, one investment strategy. Now, the one thing that I would say should be updated here is that you should have a higher percentage in international stocks or have the large cap and small cap funds be a mix of domestic and international and then maybe have a pure international fund. Um, but this is a pretty conservative approach if you wanted to have a well balanced. This isn't for a 25 year old. This would be more for like a 40 year old or 35 year old who wanted to have a little bit less risky of a portfolio and, not ha and have 50% of their assets not in stock. So that's just one example of a passive strategy you come up with a, a good asset allocation of where you want to put your money. You put it in this, this allocation grouping and keep reinvesting in it and that would be something that you could just set up and not really have to manage or look back or change much at all as time passes. And the idea for this is set this up when you're 25 and just not worry about it for your lifetime. And you're taking less risk and you're going to have less return but theoretically you should have a much more stable and a much more balanced portfolio that won't uh, react so, um, change so aggressively during a downturn because you have a lot of money in bonds and other uh, stock areas. Okay, so that's it for this chapter. The next chapter we're going to talk about efficient market hypothesis and behavioral finance and how that affects your portfolios and your potential uh, return.